You're still watching Waze. World Asthma Day um, is organized by the Global Initiative for Asthma. Um, that's GINA, a World Health Organization collaborative organization founded in 1993. Um, WAD um, is held each May to raise awareness of asthma worldwide and the theme chosen for this year is asthma care for all. Most of the burden of asthma morbidity and mortality occurs in low and middle income countries and Gina strives to reduce this burden by encouraging healthcare uh, leaders to ensure availability of and access to effective quality assured medication. The asthma care for all message promotes the development and implementation of effective asthma uh, management programs in all resource countries so ladies any of us with asthma no 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 oh, fantastic no no um, but i i but i had a uh, very yes. scary experience with someone that i was close i have a family member who is asthmatic mm. but i had a friend who had an attack and uh, almost died so, so that experience really helped me to understand uh, the importance of just being able to breathe, mm. being able to use your organs without any form of aid and, um, uh, and made me pay more attention to mm. asthma as, as, as a, I don't know, med as a medical issue or yeah, challenge. So you yeah. have more insight into it. I think that for a lot of us growing up, I think asthma was really common yeah. when we were younger. Yeah. Um, I remember in boarding school, having a lot of people having inhalers, not being able to do the morning duties like cutting grass because of asthma. So it was fairly common. I think what was unsettling for me about asthma was as common as it seemed to be, um, it was to find out that, you know, in Nigeria, people died from asthma, awesome. you know, from asthma attacks, just not being able to get to a hospital in time, not being able to get oxygen and get the support. Um, I think that's when you start to realize how serious it is. So um, a few years ago, lost, lost someone that I knew um, to very to that kind of experience where they had an attack and, you know, from one hospital to the other trying to find oxygen and, and eventually passing away. So mm -hmm. important that, um, again, with every um, single disease or ailment that we have days like this that just shine the spotlight um, and really, really get people thinking about what it means to live with, you know, a, a disease like asthma. And the ailment. To yeah, yeah. To, to be able to, to just survive and thrive, even though, um, you know, you are, you do have that um, uh, ailment. Yeah. So, um, Issy, yeah. I think I'll start with you. What did you find for us in the news? Oh, Okay. Um, my story, what actually caught my attention in news, had to do with Lagos moving forward with the uh, with um, sex offenders, basically. And the story reads: Lagos publishes three um, sex offenders details online, and this was done via Twitter. The identities that were disclosed via Twitter handle of uh, the Lagos State uh, Domestic and Sexual Violence Agency basically stated the names of all the individuals that were involved in the sexual act, uh, which were about three of them, basically. And one's name is Ido. Their names are Ido, Daniel, Moses, Olawale, Aki, Isaac, um, all three of them were respectively sentenced to seven, uh, 37 and 21 years imprisonment, basically. But the details of the individuals or the victim were not disclosed by the, um, in the handle or the Twitter handle. I think this is um, an applaudable, um, an applaudable, whatever, basically towards the right direction of the Lagos state. However, however, justice may have been served, but we still have individuals who are actually still moving around, who are still sex offenders, who we do not know their details, who we do not have the, um, an idea of where they are, and we haven't, that have not been prosecuted by the Lagos state government, or individuals who actually bring in these people, such as house helps or drivers, coming into their house as domestic staff to work and at the same time these individuals take advantage of in the, uh, the children or uh, a member of the family basically. So I think yes is the step towards the right direction but there is still more to be done. 
there should be harsher punishments for individuals who have um, who are actually sex offenders in Lagos State and the world generally. I think it's not enough for them to be jailed. I think more should be done to ensure that uh, the pedophiles and basically sex offenders are punished justly. Yeah. I mean, totally agree with you there. Certainly a lot more needs to be done. Um, what, what I found interesting about this was I think it was back in 2020, sometime during either during the lockdown or just after the lockdown ended. I remember talking about this story um, on radio back then about how they were going to start publishing the name of sex offenders. Mm -hmm. And this, this is, is the first time. Yes, yeah, yeah. so this is the first time that I'm, I'm now hearing that this is happening and this mm. is, what, three years, almost three years later. So, I mean, yeah. I know you can say better late than never, but in that time, um, is it just three people that have been convicted? Um, but like Issy said, it's a good start. So um, let's see if more names will pop up on that register and if it will in fact be a deterrent for um, other sex offenders not to commit these deplorable crimes. Yeah. Um, Jennifer, Absolutely. what did you find for us? So for me, um, the House of Rep are saying temper justice with mercy. They are pleading to the UK government on behalf of the Aquarium Madus. Um, so the UK government has found them um, has found them guilty for the breach of Novel Modern Slavery Act 2015, and the sentencing of the couple is scheduled on May 5th. But the reps from Nigeria are saying that um, that the Aquarium mothers were not aware of the UK policies concerning an issue like this, so the UK should mm -hmm. at least pardon them. And to me. I'm, I just had to shake my head. Like, you think this is Nigeria? I really cannot wait for May 5th. I really want to follow this case and hear what the government has to say. I want the sentence to be what they are going to charge them with. I'm, I'm kind of excited. They, they think it's Nigeria yeah. where you can beg your way out yeah. of anything. Um, because <laughs> they, they were saying, oh, um, it's what the parents would do with an ailing child. And I'm like, the other person's organ you wanted to harvest, that's someone's child. And if they get away with it, a lot more people will get away. And only God knows how many people have gotten away with it. And these are just the scapegoats. So, so mm. the, the thing for me really is not even knowing the circumstances. So, I mean, we know what we've heard in the story. We know, you know, nobody has the big picture. The but full picture, the yeah. fact is, it's been investigated. You've been found guilty. Um, and there are applicable sentences. I don't understand the concept of now asking for mercy. This is not a, if you do anyhow, you see anyhow. <laughs> so, you know, this is really the point where people have to realize that there are consequences for actions. And in a proper judicial system, in yeah. a proper system, you can't beg mm -hmm. your way out of something. Mm -hmm. If you are found guilty, then, you're you know, guilty. You're, you're guilty. And that's it. So, um, It'll be interesting to see how this pans out, but I'm very sure that whatever applicable um, sentences um, accompany this will, will certainly be applied. Um, Norma, let's come to you. What did you find for us today? All right. So today, unfortunately, a uh, major mishap happened in Uganda. The Ugandan minister was shot dead by his bodyguard. So the story has it that Minister of State for Labour Employment and Industrial Relations in Uganda, Colonel Charles Okilo Angola, was today shot dead by one of his military bodyguards as he was entering his vehicle to go to work. The Ugandan police were the ones that shared this information about the killing, and they said that he was uh, gone down at 8 a.m. Uh, in the Yanja suburb of Kampala. And uh, this shooting was done by one of the minister's uh, bodyguards who fired uh, several shots as, at close range. And after he did that, he fled the scene and uh, to a trading center in Kianja Ring Road where he entered the salon and then shot himself. Oh. And then people who were well, bystanders at the salon said that he had complained about non-payment of his wages and mistreatment before he shot himself. And um, this is very, very alarming. And uh, it's, not, I mean, the, the, the minister himself, his body was um, left on the road. Uh, there was a 
social media video that went viral today with him lying down in his suits in a pool of blood next to his official car. Uh, this this is a very, very disturbing situation. And um, it's something that I think the Ugandan government needs to pay attention to. Where you have people who are dealing with mental uh, challenges and you do not know. So if this is a security bodyguard who is supposed to be protecting people, is dealing with issues, uh, uh, uh uh, emotional issues, and, and, and he's been empowered with a gun. Hmm. And these are things that, I mean, we can relate to in Nigeria because we see policemen who have shot citizens and uh, they have the, 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 these are people who are supposed to be uh, protecting the citizens hmm. are now the ones who use or abuse that privilege because they have things that they're also dealing with. I think it's something that we have not really paid attention to in Africa and we need to uh, sh shed the spotlight too in ensuring that the people that are in our service units, whether it's in the police, in the army, in the air force and all of that, people who are supposed to be empowered with weapons need some level of scrutiny or some yeah. level of um, uh, accountability in, in terms of their emotional yeah. state of mind. And being that he complained about things, who knows what he's going on, what was going on in his family. He didn't have food to, or money to be able to take care of his family. And he just got frustrated and decided to just take it out. I yeah. think it's something that we need to pay close attention to, not just for the Ugandan government, but in Africa in general. It's, it's a really rising case of so many of these issues, and we need to deal with this as quickly as possible before it becomes a pandemic. Mm. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the problem is real. And I, I, I mean, the fact that this happens to be a bodyguard um, who has a rifle, I, I don't even think that that's the core. The core message for me is, look, if you're going to hire people, treat them well. At very basic, pay them their salaries when it's due. Um, I mean, you, you having someone with a gun in their hand and you're treating them poorly, you're not paying them. I mean, it's just a recipe for disaster. Um, may his soul rest in peace. It's, it's tragic that it's ended this way. Any loss of life um, is really tragic. And, um, you know, our thoughts go out to his family um, and the Ugandan people. So um, my story, I'll take this very, very quickly. I saw this last night, uh, very early this morning, actually, and I thought, oh, my goodness, this is going to be a big blow for Nigeria. My headline says, importation of Indomie noodles remains banned in Nigeria by NAFDAQ. Now, this is quite a sensational um, headline because the the main crux of the story is um, the fact that some um, dangerous chemicals have been found or substances have been found in um, noodles from two countries um, I believe uh, Malaysia and Taiwan and those two countries um, these sort of odorless colorless uh, substances found in the noodles have been tied to things like um, they're carcinogenic basically so tied to, to cancer but the fact is um, this was really, for me, just an attention grab, and it did grab my attention, so to be fair, perhaps they did achieve their plan. Um, but in truth, the noodles that we eat here in Nigeria is produced locally. Mm -hmm. So um, the, Na the NAFDAQ here is reiterating this and saying that they're carrying out checks just to make sure that these um, noodles that have been uh, recalled in those countries don't make mm -hmm. their way into Nigeria um, in any way, shape, or form. So they're yeah. being proactive about it. Uh, but, but in truth, the, the noodles that we have, that we consume here, is all no produced locally produce, here yeah. in Nigeria. And, and it has not been found to contain any of these um, dangerous uh, substances. So uh, a breather, sigh of relief for the noodle lovers out there. Um, mm. <laughs> <laughs> your dinner is safe. <laughs> but actually, you know that this will, uh, this will, this, the, the marketers will definitely increase the price of noodles based on this um, news. And they would say, oh, we are importing it now for those of us. Well, they, they can't even go that route because if they say they're importing it, then they're going to put themselves in trouble because yeah. it's the imported ones that are banned. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those are the ones that have the problem. So so right now it's safer for you to i'm local i'm local i produce here <laughs> um so we'll take a quick break um, and we'll come back and jump right into today's topic 